Hi there, welcome to IndyCar on the 15th of February. Not often they do an evening edition, but, well, sometimes I have to do them because it's too busy the rest of the time. Okay, there's three pieces of information today which I think are worth um, pointing out, or at least discussing. One of which is the um, the aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth, which um, rather notoriously seems to keep breaking down. And its latest breakdown was a result of a fault in uh, the propeller linkage on the starboard, that's right-hand side propeller of the aircraft carrier. Now, if memory serves me correctly, most large aircraft carriers have at least two propellers, sometimes three or even four. So it is possible for the Queen Elizabeth to manage to actually sail, just not very fast. And it seems that sailing is what she's actually doing. She's heading north towards Scotland. Now, this is a bit puzzling. You'd think a big aircraft carrier commissioned by the mighty Royal Navy and then its major dock down uh, in Portsmouth that they would have the facilities there to actually fix the propeller of one of their own ships, but it seems not. So it seems that the um, Queen Elizabeth is sailing north to Scotland, either to Rosyth or potentially maybe even up the Clyde towards Govan, to have this problem fixed, which is, I think, an indication of just how valuable Scottish engineering prowess is to the Royal Navy. So that was one story which um, was glossed over to a large degree by the BBC. The other piece of strange but true, um, I think you'd have to say this is a, a, a Twitter or an X outburst by Angus McNeil. Angus B. McNeil is sort of well known as being from the SNP but criticising the SNP I'm not really sure where he stands at the moment, whether he's joined Alba or whether he hasn't, but he made a post on, on Twitter which caused a great deal of shall we say, debate, and it annoyed me greatly as well. What he said was that independent support, according to the latest polling, is at 53%, and according to him, that was with the parties of independence not even trying, and we should think about it. Well, I did think about it, and the thing I thought about it was that if the independence parties are not even trying, then the only reason that independence support is at 53% or anything above 50% is nothing to do with any political parties, be they independent supporting or not. It's purely down to people like you who watch this programme or go out and march or who do other things like um, tie flags to bridges or link up all across Scotland to form a massive chain, or who do anything active to promote independence. Now, including that sort of category, um, pro-independence bloggers like Grace Peter, like Peter Bell, um, like Dick Winchester, there's many, many people on social media who have been promoting and hammering away at the independence campaigning for years. In fact, ever since 2014, most of the heavy lifting has been done by us, by the independence movement. So for Angus McNeil to say that these parties had managed to achieve 53% support for independence without even trying is a little bit insulting to the people who actually made it happen, which is us, the real people behind it. And um, I would take issue with Angus over this. I think it was a very ill-advised outburst on Twitter. What he might have been saying was, just look how high independent support is, despite all of the um, disadvantages of Scotland living in a country, or rather in a, a political entity, which does not permit us to have a free media. So despite the fact that we have no television, no radio stations, no newspapers except one which support or even ambivalent towards independence, we have still managed to keep independence support at a high level, at at least half of the population, without the political parties doing anything at all. Now why are they not doing anything? If we're able to do it, why can't they? And I think the obvious answer to that is because of the oaths they took when they were sworn in as MSPs and MPs. And those oaths mean that they are not allowed to do anything which would threaten the security or the continuation of the union itself. Which means that our political classes 
are virtually useless when it comes to gaining independence. And it doesn't matter which party it is. ALBA is equally um, constrained as the SNP and the Greens and anybody else who wants to throw their hat in the ring. Because if you operate within the system, the political system, of British democracy, in inverted commas, then you are basically hogtied. You're not allowed to do anything about independence. Now, um, as well as that, there, there have been many other little bits and pieces of information, but one which might have slipped your attention, which I think is very, very important, but was conveniently missed by the BBC and other mainstream British media sources, was the fact that the Fraser of Allender Institute issued a report, or a forecast, on the outlook for the British economy. And it's not good. As you may know, we have lurched into recession through the early part of this year and last year. And uh, the British economy is now officially in recession and has no growth. However, there is an interesting little light at the end of the tunnel which wasn't mentioned by the mainstream media. And that is the Fraser of Allender Institute also pred predicted the economic forecast for Scotland itself. And that was very different. Forgive me. Sorry about that. <laughs> One of the problems of broadcasting at night. So the Fraser of Allender Institute was pointing out that the Scottish economy is not in recession. And in fact, it is set to grow albeit at a very low rate of about 0.15% this year. But that rate of growth is set to increase above 1% in the following year and gradually edge upwards. So Scotland, in the entire UK, is the only nation which has an economy that's not in recession. And this was something which the BBC didn't really want you to know. The whole idea is that we're all in this together, so when the UK economy slumps to a ridiculously low level and goes into recession, we're all supposed to weep and worry that the Scottish uh, economic outlook is just as bleak. But the Fraser Alder Institute is an independent body. It is um, an academic body, largely, which looks at economics dispassionately. And if they say that the Scottish economy is doing OK and it's the only part of the UK economy that's growing, then I think you can take that literally to the bank. Now, this, all of this begs the question that Scotland has the right sort of engineering to repair any ship, unlike, it seems, Devonport, Portsmouth, we also have um, a ridiculous amount of support for independence, despite the fact that none of our political parties has done a single thing to actually gain independence in the last 10 years. And at the same time, our economy is growing, unlike the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, why would that be? Well, that's because the people in Scotland just get on with it and actually work on doing the things which generate income. And that usually means exporting stuff, building things, and actually providing services and goods which are physical and tangible and which we keep on doing extremely well. And that's not counting the massive success of the Scottish whisky industry over the last 12 months, which made a record profit, as I understand it, from other reports today, which weren't also mentioned in the mainstream media. And then, of course, there's our oil and gas, which continue to provide revenue, not for Scotland, but to the UK. And with any of us deciding to close the Grangemouth um, refinery in the south of Scotland, that, to me, strikes me as perhaps a strategic move by INEOS and by the United Kingdom, because we know that uh, Mr Radcliffe, who owns INEOS, is very much of the Tory persuasion. And if INEOS pulls out and we have no refinery in Scotland, that means when we do become independent, we would have to send our oil to English refineries to have it refined. Now, does that not strike you as being a bizarre thing for an oil-producing country to have to do? But again, it's all part of the dismantling of Scotland's ability to look after itself when it's independent, part of a wider strategic scheme to make sure that we can't live independently because of the fact that England's pulled out so much of our uh, infrastructure when it comes to things like oil and gas. So I think the picture is that independence support is high because people in Scotland want independence. It's as simple as that. There are a lot of shrill voices coming in from various troll and bot accounts all over the place trying to mock Scotland and mock its politicians. Well, they can mock its politicians because, well, let's face it, they're not really doing all that much and maybe mockery is appropriate. 
But on the other hand, somebody somewhere in some political party needs to grow a backbone and actually hold a referendum, but not a referendum under English rules or British rules or UK laws or any Supreme Court mandates, but simply under the auspices of the United Nations and its decolonisation process and by a ruling via the International Court of Justice so that we can have a supervised referendum which is effectively the exercise of Scottish self-determination done in a clear and democratic way which is fair to everyone including those who don't want independence but that needs more work and Scottish politicians seem to be largely ignoring this route However, luckily for us, we have Salvo working away in the background, actually doing the, the heavy lifting to get this done. So not only is independent support high because of us, the people, but actually holding a referendum is going to be down to us as well through organisations such as Salvo and making direct approaches to international legal arbiters outside of the UK so that we can actually have the democracy we're meant to have instead of living in what has now become, or always was probably, um, an authoritarian state where we have no access to democracy at all, which to be honest with you puts us in exactly the right situation to be part of the decolonisation process at the United Nations because we fit the definition so well. Anyway, that's it from me tonight. But just remember, they can't repair their own aircraft carrier in England. And um, Scottish economy is doing better than everybody else's in the United Kingdom. And independence support is massively high because the people in Scotland actually support independence, despite all the disadvantages of having an entire mainstream media which is completely against us the entire time. Anyway, I will continue with my social media efforts, and I'm sure all of you out there who are active at the moment promoting independence will redouble your efforts and make sure that that 53% becomes 55% and maybe up to 60%. And incidentally, don't believe any of the nonsense being put about by unionists who have said that we require a supermajority to gain independence. That's Labour's latest shtick, and a lot of baloney that is as well. Any simple majority is enough to gain independence. All we need to do is have a lawful ballot, a self-determination uh, exercise under the auspices of somebody who does not have any interest in the result. Anyway, I will see you soon. Thank you for sticking with me to the end. Please keep donating. As you know, the link is in the description. Um, as of now, you can still rewind this program while it's still being uh, broadcast as it is at the moment. You can also leave messages while I'm broadcasting too. And interestingly, you can also subscribe to IndyCar's channel on Facebook, which also allows me to make a tiny amount of money. In the last uh, quarter, I think Facebook has paid me $41. Wow. So I'm not going to get rich, but every penny helps. Anyway, I'll see you all soon. Thank you for sticking with me to the end of the show, and I hope you have a pleasant evening. See you soon. Bye for now.